Executive Director. We have with us also Tess Galen, our events coordinator, and Bruce Laverty, our curator, who will be giving us yet another of his wonderful talks about the history of the Athenaeum. As you may know, while the Athenaeum has been around since 1814 this month, we are celebrating 175 years in our National Historic Landmark building, and Bruce will be telling that story. We have also been closed down for the last four months in renovations to our space to create space that is as aesthetically beautiful and pleasing as, as, you, as you know it to be, but that has such amenities as some comfortable seating and lighting and enhanced gallery electrical outlets in the reading room um, and uh, heat and running water for our staff whose offices are on the third floor, which will be much appreciated by them. So I hope you will plan to come back and join us on November 9th. Buy your tickets. Um, you can get them as soon as the program is over or, or during the program, but I think you will be riveted during our program and want to wait until afterwards. But I hope you will all come to our celebration um, we do reopen on November 7th, but the big party is, is uh, on November 9th. We are also excited, as you know, PMA is, has a huge um, exhibition, Matisse in the 1930s. We are showing along with them, we are showing um, a, a collection of Matisse works that um, come from the collection of some of our members. We hope that you will come and see that exhibit as well. Now I'd like to turn everything over to Bruce, who will give his talk. You can put questions at any time into the chat or Q&A, and we will moderate those once he's done with his talk. And welcome. Thank you, Beth. And uh, uh, welcome to the uh, to the celebration. And I, I uh, second uh, Tess and Beth uh, in their recommendation that you come and join us on November uh, the 7th, uh, so you can see uh, the newly refurbished uh, building. Um, so uh, the the actual uh, birthday, uh, the, the opening of the of the Athenaeum building uh, occurred on October 18th, 1847. So that would be uh, that would be tomorrow, uh, and it was actually delayed uh, about six months um, uh, past its original uh, uh, predicted date of uh, of completion. Uh, and uh, according to the minutes by uh, in, in the building committee here, uh, John Notman uh, asked for the extra time because there. There was a spring freshet uh, in uh, Newark, New Jersey, that flooded the uh, the quarries uh, for the brownstone. Uh, so the, um, the the brownstone is, has been a major part of our current uh, current uh, restoration and, and work here. Uh, so so very soon you'll be able to see that um, in its original glory. Um, one of the great things that, uh, that has occurred in the last few years is the availability of uh, so many uh, newspapers uh, online, uh, and so I decided to take a look at the uh, the public uh, the public ledger printed here in Philadelphia uh, for the date of October eighteenth. Uh, the New York Times and the Washington Post both offer, um, you, know, uh, you can get copies of your birth date, you know, to, so you can see what was happening in the world uh, and uh, around town um, uh, on the day that you were born. Uh, so I decided to take a look at the day that th this building was born, or at least it was uh, dedicated. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to say, if you look at the far left there, uh, uh, we made, um, if not a headline, it was certainly above the fold. Uh, those of you who remember reading newspapers might uh, uh, realize how important that uh, above the fold mark was. Uh, like most 19th century papers, uh, um, the, uh, the public ledger did not uh, like to waste white space, uh, and they crammed as much uh, information uh, onto a single page as possible. But I wanted to just uh, highlight a, a couple of the things uh, here that were going on, on on that day. And so in the upper left, um, it says that the Athenaeum, the new building is a uh, uh, opening at the corner of 6th and Adelphi Streets, that was the name of uh, uh, St. James Street, uh, on Monday evening, it actually, it's a coincidence that, uh, that uh, today's Monday as well, uh, with an address by uh, Thomas Wharton. Thomas Wharton was one of the original gang of six uh, uh, gentlemen who uh, in 1813 got together and decided uh, there needed to be a, a reading room space for uh, young men to, uh, to have access to uh, great collections of, of reference materials and and uh, things that would uh, 
um, that, that would support both their knowledge as well as, as, well as their morals. Uh, Thomas Wharton had been on the board for uh, 30, uh, 33 years, uh, for as long as there had been a board of the Athenaeum. And so he gave about an hour long address, which uh, I'll try not to do today, um, but I may, um, I may reference that uh, a bit. So um, it, was a, it was a big deal, according to the public ledger, because it got top, uh, top billing. A uh, couple of the others uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about in turn that, that just got my interest. Uh, one is that um, there was an architectural drawing school uh, that John Riddell uh, had, uh, had opened. Uh, actually, he had, he, was, he had moved it from um, uh, 3rd Street uh, below Chestnut. Uh, Riddell um, would actually make a fairly big name for himself nationally uh, in the 1860s. Uh, as the publisher of um, Model Country Residences, which was a, a lavish, uh, a lavish, um, uh, a beautifully uh, watercolor illustrated um, house pattern book. Uh, and uh, uh, Riddell, like John Notman, uh, was also fond of the, um, of the uh, uh, Italianate style, particularly in its suburban, uh, in its suburban feel. Um, and uh, Riddell, uh, in, in terms, we have uh, two, two sets of Riddell's uh, pattern books here at the Athenaeum available for, for research. Uh, but the other Athenaeum connection with Mr. Riddell from that day in 1847 uh, is the house on the right here, which was uh, built, uh, completed in 1848 for a man named Michel Bouvier. Some of you may recognize his name as the uh, cabinet maker that designed the Joseph Bonaparte desk uh, here at the Athenaeum. Uh, and uh, Bouvier was a, a premier cabinet maker in antebellum Philadelphia. But he was a very uh, a shrewd uh, real estate um, a dealer as well. And um, uh, going through uh, the records, particularly of the Philadelphia contribution ship, there are 30, 40, 50 buildings uh, over a 20 year period that, uh, that he was the owner of. And he was, he was particularly interested in the area uh, on North Broad Street around Girard Avenue, and he built uh, this uh, uh, four-story building on the right uh, for himself uh, to John Riddell's designs. Uh, this picture was taken in 1928, uh, shortly before the, the building was demolished. So uh, it's always fun to read one ads uh, and to see what uh, what people were looking for uh, and uh, what they were selling. Uh, in this case, in one little uh, section, wanted a family consisting of one woolen sp uh, spinner, two power loom weavers, and one or two girls for spooling to whom constant employment and good wages will be given. Talk about a specific uh, job posting. Uh, <laughs> to, have a, to have a family where, uh, where all of those things would be together, um, uh, including the children that would be working, uh, was, uh, uh, I think, asking a lot. Uh, but um, if you had that particular, uh, that particular demographic, you could contact Israel Foster at Falls of the Schuylkill, now known as East Falls, which was a major, um, uh, a major textile uh, manufacturing area. Uh, just below that, wanted as an apprentice to a shoe making business, applied to the third door below Wood on 12th Street. Um, next, wanted a white woman to do cooking and general housework of a family. Uh, and then lastly, wanted as waiter, a colored boy, about 14 years old, one who can bring good recommendations applying to 326 Arch Street. And the, my favorite on this uh, on this page, on the front page of the public ledger, October 18th, was wanted immediately 150 stout young men, landsmen preferred to go on whaling voyages in first class ships, all clothing and other necessary articles furnished um, uh, for, um, uh, for the, the passage. And extra pay will be given to coopers, those were barrel makers, carpenters, and blacksmiths. Uh, so four years before uh, Herman Melville would publish uh, Moby Dick, uh, perhaps, um, perhaps this sounded a little more, um, uh, a little more fun uh, for the stout-hearted young man than, than uh, what would be detailed uh, in, in Melville's first great American novel. Uh, and then in an article, again, on the front page uh, that extended about five times as long as this, the title was A Tennessee Wig, and I, uh, you'll be happy that I won't read this for you, uh, but the Whig Party was the predecessor of the Republican Party, uh, and um, this 
was actually written by the governor of Tennessee. Uh, and he's talking about uh, what is going to happen uh, now that the, the, uh, the Mexican-American War uh, is over. Uh, and uh, there was a lot of people who had opposed the war, um, including uh, Henry David Thoreau, uh, as well as others, and the idea that, uh, that America should not be seeking empire. Uh, and uh, he was trying to reassure them, now that the war was over, uh, that everything would be just fine, uh, and that uh, it was our destiny, essentially, for the Anglo-Saxon race to, um, to uh, rule from sea to sea. Um, and so um, with, that, uh, with that in mind, I'll go to the, to the next slide. And uh, the Athenaeum was, was under construction uh, at a remarkable time. And uh, I've said that as the Athenaeum grows, the nation grows. Um, from November 1st, 1845, when the cornerstone was laid uh, until October 18th of 1847. Uh, and to illustrate that, I just have sort of a, a timeline that, that somewhat um, more or less reflects the construction of the Athenaeum uh, and the growth of the United States. Uh, so around the time that the foundations were laid, uh, December 8, uh, 29th, 1845, uh, Texas statehood was announced uh, and te uh, Texas was annexed, uh, joyfully annexed uh, to, uh, to the United States. Um, and um, as some predicted, that, that caused, uh, caused some trouble. And because uh, in, um, in 18, uh, 1846, uh, Congress would declare war uh, on Mexico over trouble uh, uh, there in um, there in Texas. Let me just move this away from my timeline. Uh, on June 15th in 1846, uh, not by war, but by treaty, uh, the United States added the Oregon Territory after settling uh, many years dispute uh, diplomatically, not, uh, not militarily, uh, with Great Britain over the Oregon Territory. Oops. Uh, and on September 14th, 1847, just a month before our opening, uh, US troops um, essentially ended the war uh, with Mexico by occupying Mexico City. Uh, and then as our building topped off, oops, uh, on January 24th, 1848, gold was discovered in California. And of course, California had been part of Mexico. Uh, and so um, uh, if, if people had any sort of hesitation about um, if people would travel to this, the, these new lands that had opened up in the West, um, uh, that ended all, uh, all question about that. And some, some have said that the, the, the gold rush essentially was as if somebody turned a table uh, up on angle and, and uh, population just sort of flooded uh, towards uh, San Francisco and, and, and beyond. So uh, here's, a, here's a map uh, of what is happening uh, to the United States during, almost precisely during the construction of the Athenaeum. So that uh, like the Louisiana Purchase before it in 1803, uh, which occurred diplomatically, um, the um, uh, one third of the continental United States comes, uh, comes under, our, uh, un under our governing um, during, the, during the period that the Athenaeum is, uh, is under construction. Uh, Texas, um, the area of um, uh, that would have the states of California, New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, uh, and parts of Colorado as well. And then, of course, the Oregon Territory from Great Britain. Uh, and uh, this it, it led to um, um, a uh, uh, oft quoted uh, statement from, uh, from Porfirio Dur uh, Diaz, who was 33rd president of the nation of Mexico, had uh, joined the military uh, at the age of, the Mexican military, at the age of 20, uh, blessedly in 1848, um, after the, the first Mexican war uh, was done. Uh, um, but uh, he was quoted as saying, pobre Mexico, tan lejos de Dios y tan cerca de Estados Unidos, which if you skipped Spanish class, in high school, poor Mexico, so far from God and so close to the United States. Uh, and so uh, here, uh, here um, uh, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was signed on February 2nd of 1848, just nine days after they discovered gold uh, in, um, um, in California. 
Meanwhile, back in Philadelphia, uh, we have two uh, we have two uh, politicians that I wanted to uh, to highlight. One is uh, uh, John Swift, uh, who was the mayor of Philadelphia, and Swift actually uh, was also uh, an Athenaeum shareholder. Uh, he purchased his share in uh, in 1818, thanks to our membership um, uh, coordinator uh, Natalie Guerin, who uh, who found that information for me. Uh, and then the the gentleman on the uh, on the left is. Uh, uh, Francis Schunk, uh, and he was elected governor just one week before the Athenaeum opened uh, on October the 12th, uh, uh, 1847. Uh, unfortunately, he got uh, tuberculosis and would not um, see out his term. He died about six months later. But Philadelphia was having uh, its own growing pains, uh, even as the nation was expanding by leaps and bounds. Philadelphia was growing as well, but, but it was complicated. And so here on the left is a map of Philadelphia as it appeared, the built up area of Philadelphia as it appeared uh, in the year 1840. Uh, and you'll see those heavy pink lines actually define the municipal boundaries um, of, of the city and, uh, and its suburbs, so to speak. So in that uh, familiar rectangle in the middle was the city of Philadelphia, uh, but on the lower right uh, would, be the, um, would be the district of Southwark. Uh, immediately above the city on the upper right is the district of Northern Liberties across the Cohoxing Creek, which sort of winds its way uh, through there is um, is the Kensington district, uh, Spring Garden, and then uh, and then the Penn district. Uh, so uh, Philadelphia County actually uh, had 29 separate municipalities. And if you take a look at the top ranking um, municipalities in the United States, according to the census uh, records between 1810 and 1850, the period of the uh, founding and the growth of the Athenaeum, um, Philadelphia um, uh, generally ranked uh, at least two of the top 10 uh, cities in the United States in terms of population. Uh, so by 1840, uh, Philadelphia City had dropped uh, to number four nationally, uh, but Northern Liberties was number eight. And we tend not to think of, uh, of, of these uh, neighborhoods uh, as being major, uh, major uh, centers, uh, but indeed they were. Uh, but the system was breaking down uh, as the population was, uh, was ever increasing. Uh, and in this 1842 map, uh, it, uh, I'm sorry, 1842 political cartoon, it's, um, it's really kind of a wild uh, uh, mish, uh, uh, mashup of, um, uh, of the violence that had occurred in the, the previous decade and, and actually would, would continue to occur uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the 1840s. Uh, you have uh, William Penn, the founder, looking down from heaven um, uh, and uh, he's got a peace pipe uh, that is uh, turned upside down. Uh, he does not look happy uh, at the city that he founded. Uh, his, um, the, uh, the caption of the, uh, of the cartoon is the Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. And you just see uh, the, this riot, uh, riotous um, um, uh, activity all, all over all over town. Some of the buildings are uh, are uh, not named. Some of them are very clear, uh, clearly named, and and I'll I'll mention just a couple of them. So oh there there he is. Uh, his his motto, one of his sayings, was wise laws and prompt and just administration of them. Uh, and he's looking down at a pretty lawless scene. Uh, so we see here um, uh, uh, very clearly depicted, uh, not in uh, particularly uh, sensitive terms, um, or race riots breaking out between, uh, between African-Americans and whites. Uh, and this was actually um, from an 1842 event that occurred. Uh, the African-American community had a parade here to celebrate the eighth anniversary of the um, emancipation of slaves in Haiti. Uh, and so um, they were attacked by a white crowd uh, and both, uh, both men and women uh, and indeed children uh, got into the, uh, got into the Mele. Uh, and on the uh, left-hand side here, you see that the, um, uh, the fire, uh, the, the volunteer fire companies are very much involved in the fight. Uh, there are at least two uh, fire companies there. Uh, who are uh, getting involved in this. 
um, and uh, some of them uh, were uh, Irish. There's a, an Irish repeal meeting at this club. There's a flag that signs uh, from there, Aaron Gobra, with the 1840s, with the uh, the flooding uh, of of, uh, of American cities with uh, Irish Catholics. Uh, there was great Protestant um, um, violence against them, and and vice versa. Uh, and both uh, both the Protestants, uh, uh, the white Protestants and the white Irish Catholics were also uh, fighting against the African American community here, which, by the way, lost uh, the uh, lost the vote in 1838. Uh, on the right hand side, you see a detail of uh, of a building that's uh, that's in ruins called Smith's Beneficial Hall. This is a um, uh, actually. Uh, Come, uh, come up recently, uh, Stephen Smith was um, the wealthiest black man in Philadelphia, a major philanthropist who, uh, who had uh, paid to have this hall built uh, down near the corner of Sixth and Lombard, not too far from where Mo Mother Bethel Church is. He was a member of that church. Uh, in, uh, in the riots of, uh, of 1834, uh, uh, the, uh, the beneficial hall, which was to be a lecture hall, was, uh, was destroyed um, by an angry uh, white mob uh, by fire. And uh, here you, you, you see um, a woman being shot uh, in, a, in a shop store window on Chestnut Street. We don't know exactly what that is. Uh, and then there are men, uh, there's a man protecting his wife uh, and, and fighting off uh, an intruder uh, in the window uh, above. It was a mess. Uh, the, you see here uh, the United States Bank, uh, William Strickland's bank on Chestnut Street, uh, being uh, attacked the year before the bank had gone insolvent, uh, precipitating a, a seven-year depression. Uh, and so this is uh, this is uh, the 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 state uh, of the city, and part of the problem with uh, with the, the um, with the Philadelphia police being able to combat this violence and, and, and maintain peace uh, was the, the, the divided nature, uh, the political divisions in terms of, uh, of boundaries. So that quite often, if a rider would cross South Street or Vine Street, uh, the Philadelphia police could not chase them. So um, this led to uh, a consolidation movement, which would come to fruition in 1854. Well, but in a somewhat peaceful interlude, uh, John Notman uh, finishes his work on the Athenaeum, and I wanted to show you uh, three, uh, two other buildings that actually uh, were completed by Notman uh, in that very same year. Uh, over on Chestnut Street, the Bank of North America um, at 331 Chestnut Street, uh, uh, built in an Italianate style. Um, Italianate was seen as a, um, an appropriate style, particularly for bank buildings in the 19th century, since it was the, the Northern Italians who essentially in, invented modern banking. Uh, and the other major Notman work uh, that year was the St. Mark's Church on Locust Street, uh, built in the Gothic style. Um, the 10 year period between 1845 and 55 were really um, uh, probably the, uh, the best years for Notman in terms of production uh, and, uh, and notice. Uh, and here are uh, a number of other, uh, other buildings that he was involved with. Uh, um, he uh, had strong connections with the Burlington uh, to Princeton Carter. Uh, and there were a number of major clients uh, that he worked, uh, worked with there. Uh, there's a, a, a fairly recent photograph of Ellerslie, which is a house in, uh, in Trenton, uh, and the Prospect House, which was built for the Potter family, later became the Princeton uh, Faculty Club. Uh, that's, a, uh, that's a slide from the, uh, from the 1960s by, um, by Ed Teitelman. Uh, and then in the center uh, lower part is Alverthorpe, which was the, uh, uh, which was the uh, Henry Fish, uh, uh, the not Joshua Francis Fisher a home in Jenkintown, Pennsylvania. Uh, the um, the house is gone, but the land uh, the uh, uh, the landscaped park uh, is still there. And uh, and uh, Fisher had commissioned Notman to design the suburban villa, uh, and then commissioned uh, Andrew Jackson Downing to do the landscape design. Uh, first uh, first. Um, um, known uh, commissioning of a landscape architect for a Philadelphia site. Philadelphia area site. 
Uh, other buildings downtown that uh, Notma was responsible for was his own residence, uh, just to the left of that uh, trolley car. Uh, that's the uh, the 42 on uh, 1430 Spruce Street. Uh, uh, these three buildings were demolished for the uh, Kimmel Center uh, in the early part of this century. Uh, on 16, 8, 18, and 20 Locust Street, uh, are another pair of somewhat higher end um, uh, Italian uh, residences as well. And then uh, two buildings built for uh, two different railroads, the uh, office building um, uh, to the top for the Lehigh Valley Railroad um, office, um, um, offices uh, at Third and Willings Alley uh, in Society Hill. Uh, and then below the Pennsylvania Railroad Freight Depot uh, at the corner of 18th and Market Streets. Both of these buildings from 1855. In his own words, Notman said, um, it is an excellent specimen uh, about the Athenaeum. It is an excellent specimen of Italian style of architecture treated with spirit and taste. It has an old and imposing appearance from the simplicity and unity of design and a perfect expression of its purpose. The beautiful proportion of its parts, the fine details and massive crowning cortice give it, give it an air of stateliness uh, and grandeur <laughs> and I'm trying to see the rest of the <laughs> uh, grandeur most impressive as a piece of street architecture. Um, th this is a, the earliest I've ever seen the, the use of that term street architecture uh, by, by an architect, but I get the idea that Notman wanted to assure folks that um, the Athenaeum played well with its neighbors. Yes, it was a distinctive building, but it was not um, uh, it was not one that beat its chest and screamed at the street. Uh, it it whispered uh, uh, in a in a in a self confidence, um, unlike some some more brash buildings that were going up in in the town at the time in Philadelphia at the time. Okay. Oops. So now I have to put my images back together. Oops. Sorry. Ah. So here we have a, a view from uh, 1862 uh, that shows that by, uh, by this time, uh, Washington Square on the east side was uh, completely built up. There is a, uh, if you look at the Walnut Street between 5th and 6th, you'll see the Pennsylvania Fire Insurance Company building, which uh, um, the facade of which is still there. Uh, and uh, interestingly enough, they, um, they actually misidentified uh, the Athenaeum. Um, it's called the Adelphi Building, uh, maybe because it was on Adelphi Street, although there was an Adelphi Building at the northwest corner of Adelphi and Fifth Street. So, uh, But you'll notice that our neighbors immediately to the rear uh, were the St. Thomas um, uh, African uh, Episcopal Church. Uh, and um, the uh, St. Thomas Church had been built in the 1790s uh, after the split from the St. George's uh, Methodist Church under, uh, under Absalom Jones. And... But the Athenaeum was not the first library on the block. Uh, in the basement of the St. Thomas uh, African uh, Methodist Episcopal Church, uh, founded in 1833 and incorporated in 1836 was the Philadelphia Library Company of Colored People, which was established to serve the Philadelphia's Black community by providing a place of learning and intellectual exchange, much as the library company, and I will say the Athenaeum, served the white community. Its main objectives were to build up a collection of useful books on every subject uh, for the benefit of its members and to enlighten its members on literary and scientific uh, subjects. Uh, it, was, uh, it also served as a place where young African-American men could come and practice their, um, uh, their um, uh, speech giving, uh, their, their uh, oratory and their, uh, their uh, uh, delivery skills in a friendly setting. Um, the, um, William Still of the Pennsylvania uh, Anti-Slavery Society, uh, who um, gave us the great work on the Underground Railroad, um, was an early uh, supporter of 
of, of the uh, Philadelphia Library Company for Colored People. Now, this is, um, this is just one block uh, from the library company uh, on uh, on Fifth Street, just uh, just opposite the American Philosophical Society, uh, and it was directly uh, directly behind uh, the uh, the Athenaeum building. Um, I haven't found any references to this uh, to this organization, either the church or the library, uh, in any of the Athenaeum's minutes yet. But if anybody who's listening knows anything about it, I'd very much like to like to talk to you. Um, the by 1838, the library uh, uh, company for colored people had uh, 600 volumes, and, and it was a dollar. Uh, this information I got from the Temple University Libraries a website uh, about William Still. Here's a, uh, an 1880s view of the St. Thomas Church, uh, their Fifth Street view with some of the congregation uh, out front. St. Thomas Church moved uh, in the early 20s, uh, actually the 1890s, to around 12th and Walnut Streets. Uh, it was on one of the side streets. Uh, and it's now in Overbrook, uh, I think around 61st Street and uh, in Columbia. It was actually on the news this morning. There was a there was a um, there, there was some kind of a program uh, out there. Uh, but uh, uh, it's a, a fairly a fairly nice church in the um, uh, in the uh, uh, opening address, Thomas Wharton talked about the change to the Washington Square neighborhood um, from the time that the Athenaeum was founded in 1814 uh, until 1847. This, uh, this map here is from 1796, uh, and number 45 shows the Walnut Street Jail. Number four here is the, um, is the uh, St. Thomas Church. Uh, and number 44 is the debtor's prison of the, uh, of the Walnut Street Jail. So there was a fence uh, uh, entirely around the prison property on the western side. Uh, and of course, at that time in 1814, uh, the uh, Washington, Washington Square, which was just known as Southeast Square then, uh, was known as uh, a potter's field. It was a, a place of burial uh, for, uh, for people who did not have a church uh, or synagogue connection uh, or people who were poor uh, or unidentified uh, and the city uh, buried thousands in unmarked, uh, in un unmarked graves there. Uh, and so uh, Thomas uh, Wharton uh, made two, made two um, um, points. One is that, uh, that uh, rather than looking out on a, uh, on a, uh, on a, uh, a ramshackle graveyard, um, the square by 1847 was a beautiful place that could be enjoyed by uh, mothers and children and beautifully landscaped. Uh, and there was lots and lots of talk about the Athenaeum actually be being built on the site of the debtor's prison and how the Athenaeum was not go going to go into major debt uh, for uh, for this new building. Uh, and um, that was one of the things that they 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 talked about a lot was that we were not uh, we were not sinking the uh, the institution uh, with a with a wasteful building and we we got as much as we possibly could out of the money that we had when the building was completed um, the total cost including the land uh, was forty two thousand uh, dollars and of that we uh, we um, had a five thousand dollar debt. Um, and uh, that debt was paid off in the early 1850s, thanks to the um, to the renters in our building, including the Philadelphia School Board and the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. So this is the place where we had come from, uh, our third home in Philosophical Hall. This is the place that we left behind uh, in um, uh, in uh, on October uh, October 18th. And this uh, information just came in. I'm going to check it on my phone so that I don't mess things up here. Um, one of our our assistant librarian, Rob uh, Jagiello, um, has been working on the uh, the Philadelphia Strangers, uh, uh, the Philadelphia Athenaeum Strangers book, um, which was uh, begun by uh, our librarian uh, William McElhenney. Uh, and uh, at the by the time we moved, McElhenney said that there were more than thirty thousand strangers that were listed uh, uh, in those uh, in those volumes. And so I had asked Rob if he could figure out who was the last person in the old building and who was the first person first stranger in the new building and uh, uh, he came through for us and that the last uh, the last visitor um, uh, to the uh, the rooms in the philosophical hall was a lieutenant wood of the u.s navy 
Um, and then the first, um, they started a new book when the new building started. Uh, and the first person to be registered as a stranger uh, arrived on uh, October 20th, uh, uh, Richard King of Mobile, Alabama. So those were the last and the first. Uh, and of course, uh, there were lots of designs for properties on Walnut Street uh, in earlier permutations, just uh, an idea of some of the architects involved. Um, but because we, uh, the times were very rough e economically and we had a conservative board uh, and, and, and it was a good thing that we did um, given, uh, given the, the way things fell apart uh, economically for the city, um, this prime real estate was no longer available at the corner of Six and Walnut. And by the, uh, by the 18, uh, mid 1840s, Lawyers Row had been built uh, here uh, on, the, on that block between St. James and Walnut Street. Uh, so the, um, the Athenaeum got early attention, uh, in 1848, the first history of world architecture to be published in America, uh, actually, and actually written by a woman, um, I, I noted or illustrated two Philadelphia, uh, books, uh, uh, buildings in, in her, uh, in her book. Uh, and those two Philadelphia buildings were completed within three weeks of one another. Uh, one was the Athenaeum uh, in that Thomas Sinclair uh, print, uh, a lithograph on the on the top, uh, and the other was the Girard College for Orphans, um, which was completed in November of uh, of 1840, uh, 1848. So the Athenaeum, um, to put it into perspective. Um, one and a half of the columns, and there are 34 columns uh, at Founders Hall uh, at Girard College. One of the one and a half of the columns equals one Athenaeum. Uh, so the total building cost, including the land for um, uh, for the Athenaeum, was forty two thousand dollars. Total building cost for um, for Girard College was one point nine million. It was the single most expensive building in America uh, until the time. So. Um, and since they were sort of approaching completion at the same time, um, uh, the Athenaeum leadership wanted to make everybody clear that that we were not we were not building anything to uh, to that um, that uh, sense of a, a extravagance, uh, and ours was a a thrifty um, a thrifty building. So uh, one of the the uh, major events of the uh, the evening was that uh, you could uh, a member could purchase uh, tickets for the opening of the halls and uh, with uh, with every gentleman uh, two ladies were allowed to escort him uh, and so uh, there were a lot of ladies in the uh, in the rooms uh, on that uh, on that opening uh, evening uh, and. Um, Thomas Wharton said that uh, looking around, seeing the the fairer sex there, and and how nice they looked in the in the beautiful new rooms, that um, that he hoped that very soon uh, that the the Athenaeum would uh, would uh, uh, allow female members, and um, soon uh, soon came in 1855 when the Athenaeum uh, had its first female shareholder who had inherited her her share from her uh, her father. I apologize, I didn't not write her name down. Uh, not everyone was happy uh, on that moving day. Uh, and um, in Sidney George Fisher's diary, he wrote, um, went to the inauguration of the new Athenaeum. The library was crowded and T.I. Wharton delivered a poor oration full of usual uh, full as usual of bombast, little peddlingtonisms, conceit, all the elegance, but uh, by no means reconciles me to the change. Um, my only comfort uh, is that we shall carry old McElhenney, the librarian, uh, and the steady old habitues along with us uh, to our new home. Though the former will almost lose himself in losing that old nook littered with loose literature uh, when he emerges spectacles in hand to answer an inquiry. Uh, and the chess habitues will at least for a time play much worse away from their snug and crowded corner. But it didn't take long for uh, Sidney George Fisher to warm up. 
And so by December, he said, I usually pass an hour or two a day at the Athenaeum. He could do that because he didn't work. Uh, <laughs> uh, he, he relied on his family for, uh, for support. Uh, I usually pass an hour or two a day at the Athenaeum looking over newspapers, reviews, and magazines. It has been moved to the new building erected by the company on 6th Street opposite the Washington Square. The handsomest evidence in uh, edifice in the city, in my opinion, a more quiet and agreeable place for lounging, uh, reading one could not have. Uh, and if you know anything about Sidney George Fisher, that, that is very high praise. Yeah, he, he generally did not have anything nice to say about anything or anyone. Um, and then he describes the building somewhat oddly. The lower story is rented out for office, absolutely. The second is occupied by the, by the Athenaeum reading rooms. And the fourth, I wish we had a fourth floor, the fourth by lecture rooms. Well, we didn't have a fourth floor and we didn't have lecture rooms uh, and certainly not on the fourth floor. Uh, those used by the members are, uh, are, are, are three, one for magazines uh, with reviews of books in the rear, one for newspapers in the front, and between them a small room for chess. The two reading rooms are very large with lofty ceilings, beautifully finished and proportioned, well carpeted, most comfortably furnished uh, with convenient tables and easy chairs and heated by flues and lighted by gas. Well, we're going to have uh, comfortably furnished material, uh, uh, furnishings there uh, for you if you come uh, on November the 9th. Uh, and uh, I can assure you, um, we won't have any uh, uh, fixtures lighted by gas uh, <laughs> that evening, uh, but uh, it will be perhaps as comfortable as Sidney George Fisher found it. So happy birthday 219. And I did a little, uh, I did a little searching that, you know, 175th anniversary, uh, you know, 200 is a bicentennial and 100 is a, is a centennial and 150 is a sesquicentennial. So what do you call 175th? And thanks to Google, I found out what 175th is called. It's a demi semi sept centennial. Okay. <laughs> and so how does that work? And I actually pulled out my calculator to see if it really did work. Uh, demi would be half, semi would be half, sept would be seven, uh, and then centennial for 100. If you, if you do that multiplication there, it comes out to 175. So happy, happy demi, semi, sept, centennial, 219. We're going to need a bigger cake. Thank you. Bruce, thank you. That was wonderful. Um, I know I learned a few new things and I suspect uh, most everybody who was watching did. If you have questions, please put them in the chat or the Q&A so we can uh, continue our conversation. Um, and I just put in the chat that Elizabeth Kuhn, Miss Elizabeth Kuhn was the first female member of the Athenaeum. Thank you. <laughs> thank you I, believe, I think if we're right, she inherited her share from a brother or father or somebody. We didn't get any more female members for a while, and then they came in twos or threes, and I think they probably felt most comfortable knowing they could go with a friend into these male-dominated, you know, people smoking their, their cigars and playing chess and whatever. Um, they probably wanted friends. Well, one um, of the reasons they they, they uh, had considered before this building was built, they had considered merging with the library, having a uh, a common building with the library right. company. And one of the things that kept that from happening is that the library company allowed well allowed women members, and it allowed women members to go into the stacks by themselves. Uh, and our our board our board of directors was not having that. So. <laughs> So, um, Francine, yes, the, this will be available. Um, Tess will probably sometime in the next week or two. We'll be putting it up on our YouTube and uh, will be available for you to share with friends or to rewatch yourself. Um, does anybody have any questions? I, I think you've stunned everybody with with, with everything that they, they're just gobsmacked right now and can't think of a good question, Bruce. Um, Yes, happy birthday. I hope everybody's singing a, a rousing round of happy demi semi <laughs> septentennial to the Athenaeum <laughs> right now. <laughs> um, Jess is putting up again our, our link to buy tickets. I, oh, good. Here's a question. Let's see. Um, is my background part of the library? I always get this question. Yes, it is. This is our reading room. Since the entire Athenaeum is a library, um, I know people get upset. Starbucks has a chai tea. tea. Chai means tea. Tea is tea. So 
So instead of calling it the library library, we call it the reading room um, at the Athenaeum. If you have never been, again, please come. We reopen on November 7th. November 9th is our party. It'll be an opportunity to see the space. Um, what you're going to find is that we have better lighting under the bays uh, um, than we had previously. We are going to have electrical outlets. Um, until this renovation, there were two electro electrical outlets in that room, one for the librarian's desk and one for everybody else to fight over. Um, and we're going to have some lovely new displays for, um, for recent books that have, have come out. Um, a center in the center will be tables for people who want to sit and study or write or work remotely or whatever it is that you want to do at a table. In the back will be a comfortable seating area for people whose dream it is just to come and spend the day in a comfy seat reading a book. Um, if you're like Mr. Fisher and are supported by your family or you are retired and you have the time to do that, we hope you will come. Our member lounge also, we are having a new member lounge in the first floor. The walls came down from the first three um, office spaces and we're creating a reception member area which will have a coffee and tea lounge our periodicals will be down there. The chess table will be down there so you won't have to play in a cold and drafty spot um, as Fisher was complaining that people would have to at the new, the new building back then. Um, and uh, the gallery is going to be updated. Our first exhibit again is going to be Matisse, his book Jazz in full. First time since the 1940s, it's been uh, on exhibit in full in, the, in uh, Philadelphia. So we hope you will come. Um, here is a question from Simon. Does the Athenaeum have a fire company plaque on its building or was it one of the early members of these societies? Uh, we don't we don't have a, a, a fire uh, a fire mark on the building. There is a um, uh, there there is a uh, Philadelphia Historical Commission uh, mark. We were one of the, the first 100 uh, buildings that was uh, was put onto the city's uh, list of historic structures. But we did have perpetual fire insurance i believe it was through the uh, insurance company of north america because we 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 actually sold that um about 25 years ago doesn't mean we're not insured it's just that the, the idea of perpetual insurance um, has pretty much gone out of fashion uh, and it doesn't make sense either for the company or the uh, or the insured uh, so yes we are fully insured <laughs> uh, but we i uh, to my knowledge we do not have a a fire a fire mark um um, great. And um, Sandra is wondering who was the builder of the Athenaeum? Um, the, well, the, uh, the chief contractor was a fellow named John MacArthur, uh, who was the uncle of John MacArthur Jr., um, uh, which it makes things very confusing, but John MacArthur Jr., who, who would go on to design uh, Philadelphia City Hall. Um, uh, Michael Lewis, um, in his uh, wonderful collection of essays, Philadelphia Builds, um, has, a, has a chapter about the Athenaeum, and he talks about the, the influence of Scottish builders. And of course, Notman was, uh, was a Scotsman, uh, but the, you had MacArthur here, and working in MacArthur's office was um, uh, a lithographer and, and draftsman by the name of Peter Nicholson, who was, who was uh, arrived from Scotland uh, at the age of 16 and showed up in Notman's store and offered his services. Notman had him do that uh, that lithograph, uh, but also um, also James Windrum uh, worked for uh, Notman, uh, also a uh, uh, also a Scotsman, uh, and um, I'm not sure whether whether John Fraser worked for Notman or not, but. Um, uh, in, in much of the 19th century, um, um, Scotsmen had, if not a lock, they had, they were extremely inf influential uh, in the Philadelphia building industry. Interesting, interesting. Um, so Becky is wondering um, about the graves in Washington Square. I believe she's wondering if they're still there, if they were removed, I believe they are still there. Is that correct, Bruce? Uh, yeah, they are still there. Uh, the The monument to the the, the tomb of the, uh, the the tomb of the unknown soldier uh, was uh, erected in 1957 from an unidentified soldier uh, that was found in the northwest corner of the square. When they cut that um, when they cut that diagonal uh, across the uh, the square to to make it easier for automobile traffic to get uh, get up Seventh Street, um, they uncovered remains at a fairly shallow depth. Uh, so um, uh, the, the the tomb of the un, unknown soldier, in in many ways, sort of represents 
all of the soldiers, both British and Americans, uh, who were buried there. And then, of course, those who died of disease uh, and those uh, who, who were buried there as, as, as paupers, as part of the, uh, the potter's, potter's field. Uh, and so uh, the, the square began to be um, uh, turned into a park uh, and, and landscaped uh, in the late uh, 18 teens. Uh, and the Athenaeum uh, uh, has a clutch of manuscripts from uh, the Vox family. Um, uh, George Vox, I don't know the number, but in the 18 teens, uh, actually oversaw the, uh, the, plant, the replanting of Washington Square. Uh, and so we have a list of the trees and where they were gotten from and his correspondence with John Bartram. Uh, and uh, they, they specifically mentioned planting specimens that uh, had been brought back by Lewis and Clark uh, in the square. And um, it, it was was, uh, it was taken very, very seriously. Uh, the, square's, the square's been changed a number of times since then, but um, uh, the, it was an Athenaeum, an Athenaeum board member who was, who was sort of supervising that first recovery of the, of the square or transformation from, from, uh, from Potter's Field to, to Park. And uh, speaking of, I believe um, the National Park Service estimates there are several thousand uh, yep. individuals who are buried there, including African Americans who oh, are yeah. not allowed to be buried in the other, uh, mm -hmm. the other cemeteries in, in Philadelphia, paupers, uh, unknown people, soldiers, people who died of, of the, the various pandemics, uh, around, um, and coming up, I think, uh, Tess can put in the, in the chat, a link to an upcoming tour that we are doing with our Another member of the Athenaeum, Shirley Young, who has led um, the charge for Washington Square to reach the first level of Arboretum status. Um, so she's going to be doing a walking tour of the of the park in the next week or two, I think it is, um, and kind of talk about that process. So that should be a lot of fun. And it's nice to know that the Athenaeum, our membership, has been so engaged and involved with all of that. Uh, Stephen wants to know if, if you could see, if you'd like to see again the slide with the description of the four levels of the Athenaeum. Oh, do, 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 let's see. So in that, Lynn, again, your, to your question, I just saw your question after I said this. Yes, so um, sign up for the tour with um, um, Shirley Young to uh, learn about how Washington Square became a formal arboretum since they just received that designation um, this past year. Uh, while I'm trying to get this up, if I can talk and, and do this at the same time, um, the um, uh, I, I would highly recommend a book uh, by uh, Elizabeth Milroy called The Grid and the River, uh, where she talks extensively about green space in Philadelphia. Uh, and, and she talks a lot about the condition of the of, of William Penn squares and how how all of them had really fallen into terrible disrepair by the early 19th century. Uh, and Washington Square was among the earliest, well, uh, aside from Center Square, um, to, uh, to be um, sort of brought back into something that Penn would have would have approved of. Uh, so I think this is the one that you want, Stephen, you know, about the lower story and the, the fourth and. Yeah. And while he's looking at uh, Nancy, uh, wondering if you mentioned that John Notman not only designed Prospect in Princeton, but also renovated and added to Nassau Hall in 1857. That's true, he did. Yeah, I, I, I could do a lecture on Notman uh, sometime, but I wanted to concentrate on the, sort of the highlight buildings of the of the bracket decade ar around the Athenaeum, so, just so you get an idea of, of, of his, um, his flavor. Susan, so thanks for the slide. Um... He says, unless it's just a typo, could the missing third floor be either the lofted space in the reading room or even the small office storage space? Probably the, the, the space above the chess room that you're mentioning, Stephen, which was the director's, that was the director's room at that time. Good point, because the lofted space in the reading room was a later addition. So if, if anybody, if you come to the Athenaeum, you may not have noticed as you get to the second floor, um, um, right between the, the bush room on the one side and the reading room on the other side, you, if you look up, you see uh, some windows and there's a hidden stairwell to a room, which was the meeting room for the directors of the Athenaeum. 
um, when the second floor was their entire space. And I, I think here a final question from Kital. No one has ever lived in the building, but uh, from Kital, <laughs> I'm wondering what the Athenaeum is collecting today. Who, uh, uh, so Kital is <laughs> wondering, so, so Bruce, you want to say what we're collecting today? Well, uh, the, the Athenaeum collects, uh, at least in, in my part of the Athenaeum collects uh, materials relative to the built environment, particularly uh, by Philadelphia area uh, architects and, and designers, things that document uh, document uh, the buildings here um, in, the, in the greater Philadelphia area. Um, so that's that's among what we uh, what we collect uh, what we collect today. Uh, now, in in terms of the, uh, our, our circulating collection, that's uh, that's a whole uh, a whole separate ball game. Uh, and um, uh, I do work uh, closely with uh, Jill Lee, our librarian, um, in uh, in uh, um, choosing um, appropriate reference books uh, for uh, for the collection uh, that would serve the needs of our our, our researchers in in architecture uh, and and different arts. But as far as books goes, our, our reading room, which you see behind me, is our circulating library, and that has everything from older books, not rare books because those don't circulate, but um, older books in the circulating collection, as well as everything up to some of the latest releases, um, New York Times bestsellers, award winners. Um, many people use the Athenaeum as their own uh, li circulating library. So we have a very active membership that, that uses the, li the, the library. Um, not just the research collections. Um, yes, we were open as usual during the Civil War, World War War, World War One, and World War II. We were not repurposed, um, and it was, I think, what in the uh, late late twentieth century when we lost our final tenants. Um, so we continued to rent out the space, much of the space, um, until the nineties, uh, and only only. By the end of the 20th century, had we reclaimed the entire space for the Athenaeum's use? Yeah, I think Mr. Mr. Wharton mentioned that in his uh, op opening address uh, that um, you know he he expected that soon the Athenaeum uh, would occupy the entire building, um, and uh, it only took you know 100 and 150 years, but <laughs> um, but I, I, as I like to say that in Philadelphia. Uh, Good things take a long time to happen, but they, they do happen. Well, I invite you all again. Thank you so much for attending. Um, get your tickets for the November 9th uh, reopening celebration and join us. If you're not a member, we uh, today's now is a great time to join as we are planning to reopen again on November 7th after being closed for four months. Um, we are almost done with our interior renovations as well as our exterior restorations, which are uh, restoring the building to its original glory. Um, so please join us and become a part of our lively community. We look forward to seeing you all soon, whether in person or at one of our online events. And I hope all of you have a wonderful, wonderful afternoon. And that this has been a great start to your week. Happy Demi Semi Centennial to the Athenaeum. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Bruce.